This picture is the official logo of the 1994 Clementine Deep Space Mission, and it contains a cryptographic message. Someone deeply involved wanted to disclose the conspiracy, committed by the United States Department of Defense. Here we see the front cover of the Brookings Report. The Brookings Institution wrote this in 1964 NASA. The report examines the potential implications for the discovery of extraterrestrial life. NASA knew that probably one day satellites, or manned missions, would find alien artifacts, alien technology or alien life. The report also includes a study, how governments should handle information, and it mentions the possibility that under particular circumstances, a government might, or might not find it advisable, to withhold the discovery of extraterrestrial life, from the public. Project Golden Dragon provides indications, which suggests that the United States government, made a discovery on the moon, and found it advisable, to withhold this discovery from the public. Here you see a drawing of the Clementine satellite, and the two smaller photos, show the Deep Space Mission Operations Center, from where Clementine was controlled. On the 25th of January 1994, the Deep Space Program Science Experiment, or Clementine, was sent to the Moon, by the United States Department of Defense. The satellite, exposed to extreme heat and cold, had to deal with the high level of radiation. Clementine sensors looked in the ultraviolet, visual and infrared spectrum. The digital camera, a Thompson MMPC CD camera, was of military standard, and produced a continuous string of film strips, of 5 kilometers wide. Overhead the lunar south pole, the satellite flew at an altitude of 425 kilometers. The resolution varied from 7 to 20 meters depending on both sun, and camera angle. In November 1991, the Naval Research Laboratory was briefed, by the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, on the Clementine concept. Government agencies only act, when they receive proper fundings, and the Naval Research Laboratory, received fundings in March 1992, so in a normal situation, this would mean that the Naval Research Laboratory, started with the DSPSC project, in March 1992, but is that true? I found this resume, of someone who worked for the NRL, and who was involved in the DSPSC program, till May 1991. Did the Clementine program, start before November 1991? The original and untouched resume, is on file. What about this mysterious case, of a sudden computer malfunction, which caused the depletion, of all fuel Clementine needed, for course corrections, so it was unable to perform? the second phase of the mission. Flying to asteroid geographos, and taking images for scientific purposes? Was there really a malfunction, and did Clementine lose her fuel, and electrical power? We are being told the same story over and over again, and from various sources. Unfortunately we cannot check the story, of the fuel depletion ourselves, but is the satellite really as dead, as the military claims? Nine months after the satellite had been declared dead, by both the military, and NASA, this message had been left by Stephen Collins, who is a former Mars Observer flight team member, and who works for JPL, NASA. He congratulates a mysterious group, nicknamed the Batcave Bunch, on their recent contact with Clementine, and he specifically mentions the people, that built the battery. In other words, Clementine never was completely dead, as the Batcave Bunch would not have been able to connect to Clementine's onboard computer. Clementine is still in space, certainly not lost and gone forever, but real-time tracking is difficult. Of all online satellite trackers, there is only one that actually tracks this satellite. Clementine 1 uses NORAD identification, 22973 and COSPAR identification 1994-004A. As we can see, the satellite is about 350,000 kilometers from Earth, on March 8. On March 27, the satellite is very near Earth, and as we can see on the next image, 
the satellite is just about to make the swing around Earth. According to an official statement made by Colonel Bridges, Director of Defense Information U.S. Department of Defense, on a press conference on 3 December 1996, Clementine is to be seen as a little planet, moving around the Sun in an 11-year orbit and it would be back near Earth, in nine years. However his information does not match today's orbital data, as we clearly see, that Clementine is not, in an 11-year orbit around the Sun, but in high eccentric orbit with Earth, and based on revolutions per day, she is near Earth 32 times each year, with the closest approach, of 801 kilometers. Either the military is not properly informed, the statement false, the transcript not correct, or someone is not telling the truth. This is hypothetical, but should Clementine be operational, then the satellite is Earth's most forward early warning system, for any approaching known or unknown objects. With cameras capable of looking in multiple wavelengths, Clementine might be able to detect potential threats from outer space. The old Clementine Internet Browser version 1.5 no longer allows the download of files. When we communicate with the server we see its unique name, Galilei. The military has never been officially involved in scientific missions before Clementine, but is this a reference to Galileo? which is a scientific and non-military mission from 1989. The United States Department of Defense sent a satellite to the moon, and the big question is why? There are official readings but what if there was a hidden agenda? The Galileo spacecraft was launched on October 18, 1989, and performed two moon flybys. The first one on December 8, 1990 and the second on December 8, 1992. Galileo provided clearer views of the lunar dark side, and the polar regions of the Moon, than all lunar orbiter and all Apollo missions. Of all high-resolution images that Galileo took, these photos are the only images available. Is there something on the Moon that we are not supposed to see? Perhaps an activity that produces colorful lights, lightning and temporary coloring of the moon's surface? This is the front cover of an official NASA report. This report from July 1968 contains hundreds of sightings of transient lunar phenomena. These sudden and short colorings of the moon's surface have been observed for at least 1,000 years, and often by multiple witnesses. Although scientists claim we see outgassing, or the impact of asteroids, on the moon's surface, there is no real evidence that builds these theories, so it is still a mystery. This is probably one of the best photos ever taken of a transient lunar phenomena. Made by Leon Stewart from Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA, on the 15th of November 1953. Look at the bright spot located between Pallas and Schroeder. Crater Alphonsus is known for reports of glowing reddish clouds. October 26, 1956, Deans Moralter took photos of the crater in ultraviolet, and he saw blurred rills on the floor. The blur was not visible on the infrared photos, and professional astronomers did not accept his explanation of possible volcanic activity. Another observation concerning Alphonsus was done on November 3, 1958 by Nikolai A. Kozarev. While looking through the eyepiece of a 50-inch reflector, he observed that the central peak of the crater had an unusual reddish color, and looked blurred. Spectrograms showed the emission of carbon vapor, and this confirmed his observation. Nikolai. Believed to have seen possible volcanic activity, but his emission results were never officially confirmed. Almost one year later, on 23 October 1959, Nikolai Kozarev reported another sighting of a reddish TLP in Alphonsus, and again the spectrogram showed unusual features. There is great variety in the descriptions of transient lunar phenomena, as they can be star-like, 
bright and sparkling spots in various colors, red spots, bright clouds, hazy, nebulous or luminous, red or yellow beams of light, and in some cases there are very clear descriptions of lightning on the moon, many in combination with weird moving shadows and glows, vapors, smoky, dark and gray mist, and also reports have been made of volcanoes, visible during a long period of 15 till 30 minutes. Ever since this photo was made available, people thought it was photographed in space. The shape is weird, and indeed it looks like an object flying overhead the moon. It is not. Look what happens, when we turn the image and play with the contrast. After rotating the image, we see a bright glow and weird shadows, on the moon's surface, so in my view we see a transient lunar phenomena. During the Apollo missions, 200 astronomers from 34 countries worked for LION, the Lunar International Observers Network, part of the Smithsonian Center for Short Life Phenomena. LION evaluated Earth-based TLP observations, and tried to verify their observations with those made by the Apollo astronauts. July 19, 1969 German astronomers observed a bright luminescence in crater Aristarchus. NASA was informed and they asked the Apollo 11 astronauts, who are still orbiting the moon in their command module, to look at Aristarchus. It was Neil Armstrong who reported back. Hey, Houston, I'm looking north up toward Aristarchus now, and there's an area that is considerably more illuminated than the surrounding area. It seems to have a slight amount of fluorescence. Till March 1978 there have been 448 reports of TLP. In Aristarchus. This is a photo of Aristarchus, taken by Mike's Astro Imagery on December 17, 2005. Was Lion part of the Apollo program, and had they been waiting for something to happen? Why would I bring up transient lunar phenomenon in this presentation? With bare eyes it is hardly visible, but this reddish spot on a color photo of the moon, taken by Galileo, deserves a closer look. I rotated the image and selectively removed colors. The final result is a photo in grayscale with one red colored area located between the Shiner Crater and the Blancanus Crater. The red area and the moon surface are extremely blurred, but thanks to forensic image software we can deblur and refocus the image to an extent that we can see the smaller craters next to Shiner and Blancanus, and recognize the contours of the moon's surface. With the photo deblurred we clearly see the craters, the TLP area and in the center a tiny bright white spot. This white spot is not created by the software as I will show you. The Shiner and Blancanus crater are located on the lunar south pole, but can be seen by telescope, as the photo on the right taken by a telescope from Earth shows. Is this bright white spot also visible in other photos taken of the Moon? As a matter of fact it is. Here are two samples. The first picture comes from Google Moon and is from Clementine Lunar Internet Browser version 1.5. The bright spot is clearly visible next to the arrow. The second image comes from Clementine Lunar Internet Browser version 2.0. We apparently see the same two craters but from a different angle. The white spot stands out from the rest of the moon's surface. On the 23rd of April 1994, a transient lunar phenomenon occurred in crater Aristarchus while Clementine was orbiting the moon. Clementine took pictures of the crater, and provided conclusive evidence that the crater walls had turned redder, after the transient lunar phenomena. After March 1978, official registration of transient lunar phenomena apparently has been discontinued, as I was unable to find reports made after 1978. This is weird, as a task force of 200 astronomers had been formed during the Apollo program to investigate the phenomena, and NASA nor any other space agency shows any interest. See these hundreds of sightings on the lunar near side. Would it not be wise to further investigate this, concerning the safety of astronauts, and in view of planning landing sites for future missions?
Other investigators also try to unravel the mystery of the hidden object. Here is a short overview of the achievements of two, for me, very important researchers. Mr. Joseph P. Skipper and Mr. Jose Escamilla. Mr. Skipper does not perform image enhancements on the images he investigates. His tools are his eyes, and he tells his visitors on www.marsanomalyresearch.com what he sees in the photos. This famous picture with the Zeman anomaly was uploaded on May 28, 2004. We see a smudged or obfuscated object without details. Years later another pioneer also made an attempt. Mr. S. Camilla, hired for his movie, Moon Rising, a forensic analyst. Conclusion of this forensic analysis, of which I have a copy, reads as follows, It is impossible to determine, if the smudging was a deliberate act of, differencing, or defacing, of the image, or was caused by some error in transmission, or lies within the MRSID codec. The expert also claims that no repeatable process is available, to discern what was present before the smudging took place. Project Golden Dragon delivers proof of, a deliberate act of, differencing and defacing, of this image. This image shows the enhancement, made by Mr. S. Camilla, who believed to see the contours of a humanoid standing next to a spaceship or machine. This would mean that the object would be two times the size of New York, and although this may seem impossible, I ask you not to judge too quick as in this presentation, I will show you things you never believe to be possible. It is tradition that a logo is created for every mission. The Clementine logo is one big mystery. I found several versions of the mission logo. Some are heavily compressed but there is one thing they all have in common. Look at the very tiny sketch in the yellow and red circle. The same tiny sketch on all mission logo, except one, where the object looks blurred and the shape is different. The Clementine mission logo, created by the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, the Naval Research Laboratory, and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, is very different but why would someone change the first official logo? When we look at the many differences it becomes clear that they must have a very good reason for a different logo. Features have been changed, from male to feminine. We see that the firm hand of a man is now a more gentle grip, and the robe on the left picture, changed into a woman's dress on the right, where they also added a neglice, and a pickaxe. Conclusion, a stately looking man, the god Apollo, was changed into a young woman, Clementine, the coal mine. Apollo? Yes Apollo. Compare the person on the logo, with the statue of Apollo, and the face, mirrored, found on the Apollo 17 mission patch. Was this originally an Apollo mission, changed by the Department of Defense into Clementine? The first mission logo was a complete drawing, but not this one. When we look at the moon surface, and compare it with the rest of the logo, we see a totally different pattern. In my view this logo consists of two parts namely a drawing and possibly a piece cut from a photo, because of the clearly visible compression artifacts. The shield held by Clementine shows three four-sided diamonds, but we neither find the shape in the logo of the BMDO, nor in the logo of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. What does that mean? Is this another cryptographic message? In modal logic these diamonds express, that there is possibility, and in military terms the diamonds stand for camouflage. Could Was the Clementine mission a false flag operation? The flag on the moon looks fake, as it does not show the actual numbers of red and white stripes. There should be seven red stripes, and six white ones, but we see five of both of them. this logo. 1. The crescent moon is symbolic for new beginnings, and the making of dreams into reality. 2. 
The official reading of the number 9, written on asteroid Geographos, is that it refers to the size of her shoes, as in the lyrics, and her shoes were number 9. The number 9 represents something totally different, and what it is I will show you later in this presentation. 3. The famous vector symbol indicates a direction of travel, and here it means that something landed on the moon. 4. The fake shadow underneath the flag is the geographical location of Schrodinger Crater. 5. The shield held behind the moon could mean that the moon is protected by or Earth is protected from. With number 6 we see a rather detailed but mysterious object in what appears to be the Zeeman Crater, and this primarily is the reason for Project Golden Dragon. Finally with number 7 we see a weird object in the center, and in my view this either represents the lunar south pole, or this is a map of the Aitken Basin. The sketches drawn onto the moon's surface, can be made better visible when we increase contrast and reduce gamma levels. Once we have colored in borders, we see three very distinct shapes, and these are unlike craters and lunar seas, which are shown as dots and stripes. I have showed you a logo drawn prior launch of the Clementine, and this logo shows lots of weird symbolism. Is someone, cryptographically, telling us that there is something, on the dark side of the moon? Why else would anyone draw this? Was it because they had seen an object like this, in the Zeeman crater, long before the Clementine mission begun? I showed this image to an American professor and asked for his opinion. This is his response. The shape of the strange area is fully compatible with a missing data block. To me, having worked with similar data, it looks like they ran a fairly advanced algorithm to interpolate the missing data block, but these advanced algorithms can sometimes introduce artifacts that look like artificial structures. I can certainly recognize some of these effects right in that image. Now that is really interesting, as what this astronomer and most people do not know, or perhaps tend to forget, is that this image is not a photo but a composition. This is an official quote by the NRL. The ultraviolet and visual camera, with five filters, and the near-infrared camera with six filters, will each collect overlapping images. Each filter is used along the satellite's ground track, such, that complete mapping of the lunar surface, for each of the filters of each camera, will be accomplished during the mapping operation. The high-resolution camera, will make a continuous string of overlapping images. Between the 19th of February, and the 22nd of April 1994, Clementine made an unknown number of film strips of the Moon. Every five hours, one revolution around the Moon, some 6,000 images were received at the DSPSC Mission Operations Center, which was operated by the NRL. Imagery experts had only 15 minutes to both examine and censor images before they made them accessible to scientists. There was no time for complicated obfuscations, so they used a basic technique which proved to be very successful. At the longitude and latitude of the Zeeman Crater, a single scan by Clementine had a width of 5 kilometers, and a height of 2 kilometers. This image is put together from 7,590 images, and the size of the object is approximately 98 images. We know that Clementine needed 5 hours for one revolution, and one revolution means, one continuous film strip of 6,000 images. The Zeeman smudge is one data block of 12 film strips and this means, 12 times 5 hours equals 60 hours. So Clementine had data transmission problems during a period of 60 hours. At one specific location where 12 film strips show 12 missing data blocks. Okay, it is not impossible but I consider that highly unlikely. On the 13th of February 2010, the Clementine browser version 1.5, was replaced by version 2.0, and all previously reported lunar anomalies had been removed. The NRL claims that with version 2.0 the quality of the images dramatically improved. When we compared both versions, 
We indeed see a difference in quality, but that has nothing to do with a higher browser version. Look at the shadows in the crater, which are different, because other film strips were used. The Zeman anomaly did not disappear because of a better algorithm, but because they replaced images. The moon map in Clementine browser version 1.5 consisted of 170,000 images, but the number of film strips used to make this map is unknown, until this date no one can tell for sure how many images Clementine produced. I have found five websites with each their own official number of images. Let us take a closer look at these sites. The first one is the Naval Research Laboratory. On this website Clementine's captured 1.8 million images, but what do we see on SputusLunarResources.com? Now that is interesting. Where the NRL mentions 1.8 million images, the Silva website tells us that Clementine returned over 2.5 million images. That is a difference of 700,000 images. Did they made a mistake? Let us take a look at website number 3, named Applied Coherent Technologies, a civil company responsible for Clementine's moon mapping. The website of ACT also mentions a different figure, namely a data volume of 2 million images. Now we already have three websites which do not match, but it gets better. This is the website of the United States Department of Defense, and there we see a much lower figure. According to the United States military, Clementine recorded approximately 1.5 million images. Finally we pay a visit to the Missile Defense Agency, successor of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, who is the successor of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, who is the initiator of the Clementine mission. What figure do we see here? 1.5 million images. When we do a quick calculation, we see something interesting. There is a maximum deviation of 1 million images between non-military and military organizations. What was so important that a million or more images never have been made accessible to the general public? This is a photo of the mark of Neil Armstrong's moon boot. He was the first human to walk on the moon, but was he also the first visitor? Probably not, as I have found another mark. Finding the mark of this giant foot was not easy. In fact it is completely hidden from eyesight, and to us humans it is invisible. First let us take a look at the main image. As you can see, I only use images from official sources. In this case the NASA photo journal. This is a composition picture, made by Clementine, of the south polar region of the moon. The mark was found just above the smaller Zeeman crater. This image shows the smaller Zeeman crater with enhanced contrast and brightness. The mark, clearly visible as a combination of two letters L, literally stands out from its surroundings, as it is much brighter. The shape is interesting as we see rather straight angles, which appear unnatural. As I have already told you, the mark is not visible to us humans, as our eyes cannot see it. That is why we need the help of image forensic software, which can substantially increase and differentiate contrast levels. For this purpose I used Optipix Auto Contrast, but we still cannot see any of the finer details inside the mark. To reveal those details we need, micro-contrast software, that works on, pixel level. Here we see the same image, but this time I divided the area of interest, in fields, and performed, micro-contrast enhancement, of each part. Inside the mark we see, vertical, diagonal and horizontal bars, and this does not look natural, but artificial. The tracks stop outside the mark, so these bars we see, are not created by the software. After a negative 2D to 3D conversion, we clearly see that this is the mark of a mechanical foot with perfectly parallel and symmetrical running lines. Notice the size of the foot, which must be tremendous, as it is at least 4,000 meters in length, 
2,000 meters wide, and the mark must be 50 meters deep. This truly is the mark of a giant. Fortunately, the camera produced images in the visual, ultraviolet, and infrared spectrum, as else I never would have noticed the difference in color, on the crater floor, in the exact location, where the object was standing. Most images published on the internet, hardly show colors, and they all look grayish, so in order to make the colors visible, I used software to stress the various colors, in the image. Here we see the untouched full resolution image, with reference, UI73S217, taken from CD volume, CL4077. Pictures contain a lot more information, than most people are aware of, and with an image analyzer, we can make hidden data visible. Having analyzed this picture, I noticed that it had been manipulated by software, called Image Alchemy, version 111, but what exactly does this software do? On the website of Handmade Software Incorporated, we find a manual that explains what the software is capable of. As we can see, the software manipulates computer image files, but what makes it so special is that Image Alchemy can change the number of colors in an image and color space. Why would someone change colors in an image unless this someone does not want to reveal true colors? Clementine took images of the moon in the visual, ultraviolet and infrared spectrum. By using light reflectance and light absorption properties of material, we are able to determine composition, see abundance of water molecules, detect an alteration through heat or chemical processes, and if material corroded or eroded. This image comes from mapaplanetexplorer.com and it shows the Zeeman crater in the visual and ultraviolet light spectrum. Everything looks gray and dull. But once we emphasize colors, the surface starts to look different. The surface inside the smaller crater has changed from gray to blue. Notice that the blue material is concentrated inside the crater and on the crater rim, but outside, there is hardly any blue material. What would this crater and the moon surface look like in infrared? The material has turned into green. Again, we clearly see that the concentration of material is inside the crater. This raises questions. What is this material, and why is it located in the exact position of the smudged object? I am no industrial chemist, but to me, this looks like the result of a chemical reaction. By playing around with the wavelengths, we create more color variations. The image in the lower left corner is the result of a combination of bands. One. 5 and 3, but regardless the wavelength, the colorful material will always show up inside the crater. So this must mean something. Clementine images are unique, and uploaded to other websites, you would expect to see the same colors. However it appears that someone does not want you to know the true colors of the material in the Zeeman crater. Let us take a look at another NASA website. Welcome to LMMP which is a NASA website. We use the same base map and select from the menu the ultraviolet and visual image mosaic. Instant we see that this image is different as there are no colors. This is a 100% grayscale image. Comparing the two images, we see a difference. What is the reason for NASA to upload a grayscale image instead of the original color version? And what is this colorful material, we are not allowed to see. Perhaps in other material, we can find the answer. There are indications, that suggest, that Clementine's images, may have been manipulated. Is the Zeeman crater hiding something? With bare eyes, the surface appears normal. This changes, when we bring out more detail, by sharpening edges. On the bottom of the crater, we see weird looking objects. Are these rocks? Well if these are rocks, then they are massive. Several hundred meters long and hundreds of meters wide, as this small crater is 22 miles in diameter, and over 2000 meters deep. Look at the center of the image. Do you see this small chain of objects? 
is this really a natural rock formation? I deliberately did not filter any compression artifacts, so you can see that these objects are not created by the software during the process of image enhancement. In the previous chapter, I showed you that the smaller crater contains material of various colors. When we take the original Clementine color image, would we not see these strange objects? Here are two images. The one on top is the original image from Clementine, and the lower image is the color emphasized version. The blue and green colors we saw, must be the weird objects, because the lunar surface around the objects, has a different color, namely a light orange tone. There are people who question this observation, and who claim, that these green and blue spots, are color artifacts created during the processing, of the film strips. Interesting theory, but when we look at the latest color image, taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we see that my theory is confirmed. There is blue and green colored material, inside the small crater. I will now reveal, the alien machine, and for me, this is the most scary part, as how can I explain to you, who have never seen anything like this before, what it is. The object may seem unreal, as there is nothing like this on Earth, and there is no way to compare it with something else either. Take for instance the dimensions. The object is 57 kilometers long, 22 kilometers high and 5.5 kilometers wide. This means that it is two times the size of New York, and taller than any commercial airplane can fly. Can you possibly imagine, what it would like when this object, would be standing on Earth? The object, on the original image is too small, to perform enhancements on, so I had to increase the size of the object, for which I used photo zoom, with the S-spline algorithm. Why did other investigators, before me, fail to reveal the object? The answer is very simple. In reality, there is no smudge. What we see is the result of a method of obfuscation, known as clipping, and conventional software simply will not work. Clipping is the conversion from one tone, to a new gray or color tone, and by equalizing lighter and darker levels, this results in loss of detail. Details are still there, but our eyes simply can no longer see them. In our case everything inside the clipped area, turned to gray, and this looks like smudge. What remains a mystery, is what software, they used to perform this type of obfuscation. During the enhancement process, I noticed that the object was partially transparent, and translucent, which made it more difficult to bring out details. Another problem I faced, was that this was not a photo, but a composition, and the object therefore consisted of, 12 film strips, with each their own brightness, contrast and gamma levels. Considering different lighting conditions, I needed to enhance each part individually. Well ladies and gentlemen, here it is. Look at the red lines, and follow the contours. This alien machine matches the shape of the drawing. The Department of Defense, already knew prior launch of the Clementine, what it would look like and where they would find it. Or do you believe that they could look into the future, and knew that at the Zeman crater, there would be a series of 12 missing data blocks, that matches the shape. I know that for most of you it will be difficult to see details, so I will try to explain what I and others see. The object is three-dimensional, and the skin or hull consists of many parts or scales with different colors. The scales are flexible and extendable, which could move in every direction, so my theory is that we are dealing with a shape-shifting machine. Perhaps one of biomechanical nature, and I would describe it as a gigantic caterpillar, with multiple legs that crawls or walks over the moon's surface. As we all know, digital artifacts, do not create shadows of their own. More evidence, that we are dealing with something real, and not a missing data block. What you see here is the back of the machine, with a close-up of the leg. The lower part of the machine is fully flexible, and this would allow it to cross all kinds of terrain and it even could climb mountains. 
Here we are halfway the machine, where the long extendable neck starts. Next to the end of the large scales, near the yellow arrow, we see these small black lines, which in my view are shadows. There are brighter parts as well, which indicates that it might reflect sunlight, or emit light itself. The machine seems to have an upper body, made of flexible scales, and a lower body, constructed of flexible bundled cables or strings. By using different levels of contrast, I managed to make other and more details visible. I will show you four different levels, out of the over 3000 enhancements I made. If you did not see the machine yet, maybe these images will change that. Have you ever wondered, where these weird, horseshoe shadows came from? Well, here is the answer. The horseshoe, appears to be a part of the machine, which casts its shadow, on the moon's surface. Underneath the front of the machine, we see this odd looking thing. In my view, this is some kind of suction unit, or a device, that can spray chemicals. I will come with an explanation, for this theory, later in this presentation. First let us examine the suction unit. The lower part of the unit looks square, and there is a large hole in it. In the back, there might be two more units. Next to the suction unit, we see two strange looking objects, of which one appears to have multiple legs, and maybe this is my imagination, but I recognize the shape of a Scorpio. Could this be a much smaller machine, standing on the surface? Small is relative, as this little machine is almost one kilometer in length. Or are we watching something natural, and this is just a bunch of rocks, and our fantasy is running wild? I try to make a better enhancement, but this is the best I could make of it. The human eye, is built to pick up light intensity, and colors, but with the machine in grayscale, for some of you it may not yet be visible. A color image, would be the best solution, but these images do not exist, or were never made accessible, so where do we get it? There is a way, to create colors in a grayscale image, by using a free software called, RGB lights. So, how does it work? First we create from one image, a few new images, all equal in size, but with different scale and contrast levels. Then we load these images, into the software. One image for each color. The software, will join the images, and create a new single, RGB image. Second step, is to separate colors from our RGB image, through equalizing. For that special processing, I used Helicon Filter version 4.9.3, which is free software. The process is very simple, and it does not require specific skills. 1. Use the sliders, to set the level of saturation. 2. Use the equalizer, to select the color tones, you wish to see in your image. 3. Select the spectrum sensitivity. And finally step 4, is to use the equalizer, to reject the colors from the image, you do not wish to see. After the gray to color conversion, and the equalization process, 
we are left with an image with artificially created colors, and the result is unbelievable, as these samples show. Minerals, and ores, change color, when they are exposed to chemicals. On Earth, we use a combination of acidic solutions, and high electrical discharge, to extract rare elements. Could this explain transient lunar phenomena, as descriptions, mention lightning on the moon, vapors in all colors, smoky mist and moving glows? How else, would a highly advanced, extraterrestrial civilization, excavate the moon? They cannot extract minerals, and metals, by beaming it from the rocks. They must have technical limitations as well, despite incredible size machines. The floor of the smaller crater, shows many different colors, and perhaps we see, the result of chemical processing. Colors of the moon's surface, vary, and from Clementine we know, that regolith, in, and around the Zeeman crater, has a light orange tone. I did some RGB experiments, and managed to find this specific color, in combination with the copper color machine, so is this the original color? After the color conversion, we see right below the machine, a few small light blue areas. Do these areas contain fluids? Are we witnessing, the excavation of the moon? We know that during chemical extraction, Materials change color, and gases are formed. Underneath the machine, the area looks foggy. Is that because of chemical vapor? In the Clementine song, the number 9 written on asteroid Geographos, refers to the size of Clementine's shoes. And her shoes were number 9. Shoe size on an asteroid? Shoe size has nothing to do with it. The pound or hash sign, usually attached to a keyword or phrase, identifies a message on a particular topic. In China, the number 9 is connected with, Chinese dragons. Chinese dragons are described in terms of nine attributes. Their skin is covered with 117 scales, 13 times 9, 
of which, 81, 9 times 9, are yang, positive, and 36, 4 times 9, are yin, negative, or reversed. The number 9, is connected with Chinese dragons? That is interesting, but so is this. Look at the sketch that we found on the logo. Does that look familiar? No? Then you probably are not Chinese, as the shape of this object comes back in Chinese characters. After we rotated the image, we see that the Chinese characters pretty much look like the sketch. Especially the Chinese dragon seal, which even has the two holes in it. Here we see one of the earliest painted dragons, created in the year 1244 AD. This is one dragon of a total of nine, taken from a hand scroll, called the Nine Dragons, which is now located, at the Museum of Fine Art, in Boston, USA. Imagine this. You live in an era, without advanced technology. Suddenly you see something incredible, but you have never seen anything like this before and do not know how to describe it. What do you do? You start looking around you, for objects you know, and you use multiple objects, in combination, to make a thorough description. My theory is, that the Chinese, and other nations as well, saw smaller types of these alien machines on Earth. They archive these events, describing them in stories, making sketches, paintings and even portray them, on shields, banners and flags. Or does this sound strange? How would the ancient Chinese portray a dragon? My theory, is that they used specific animal parts, to describe it. A Chinese dragon, has nine anatomical features, the head of a camel or horse, the ears like a cow, the fiery eyes of a demon, the horns of a deer or stag, a long neck like a serpent, the scales of a carp, the belly of a frog, the paws of a tiger with three or five toes, the claws of an eagle with three or five nails. Also mentioned in ancient descriptions, the dragon has a long beard, spines on the back, a foot rule, which is a large device on the head, and stretched or folded wings. According to Chinese legends, the first dragon ever seen, appeared in the sky, around 4000 BC. So is the alien machine, a Chinese dragon, and does it have the same anatomical features? Did you expect this? This machine, has remarkable similarities, with the list of animals, the Chinese used to portray a dragon, but why should the dragon, be of golden or copper color? Looking at the animals and the colors of the animal parts, we see something remarkable, the head of a camel is brown or light orange, the horns of deer white and brown, the fiery eyes of a demon are yellow or orange like fire, the colors of a tiger's paw are yellow copper and orange, eagle claws are mostly brown and yellow, the belly of a frog is described as white brown or yellow and the scales of a carp often look brown copper or golden. This indeed, looks like the colors in our machine. We now have seen, that the alien machine, has some of the anatomical features of a Chinese dragon, but is there more that substantiates my alien dragon theory? As a matter of fact there is. Take a look at this image for example. Dragons, had an almost unlimited range of supernatural powers. They could shapeshift, change their color, as an effective form of camouflage, or they could glow in the dark. The colors of Chinese. Dragons vary, but most dragons vary from greenish to golden. They have a series of alternating short and long spines extending down their backs, and along their tails, where they become longer. The dragon has long tendril-like whiskers, extending from either side of its mouth, which it uses for feeling its way along the bottom of muddy ponds. Under its chin or floating just out of reach, the dragon, has a bright shining pearl, and on the head a device, which is called the Pol Shan, or foot rule. Without this, the dragon cannot fly. The scales of the dragon's throat are reversed, 
and when a dragon exhales, it produces clouds of fire or rain. The dragon's breath changes into clouds, comes out as fire or rain. Is fire to be interpreted as lightning, or in other words, an electrical discharge, and rain to be seen as the spring of fluids? Here's another myth. Where dragon blood is spilt, and has been spilt in the distant past, no vegetation will grow. Could this be a reference to environmental pollution? That dragons, used chemicals on soil and polluted the earth? When the Chinese, would see this alien machine flying through the heavens, lit by sunlight. What would it look like? Perhaps like a dragon on fire, and is that why dragons spit fire? Many ancient Chinese drawings, show flames, coming from the dragon's feet. Underneath the machine and on the moon's surface, we see tentacle-like objects. In the painting we recognize the two long antennae or whiskers, and we see those as well in our alien object, so we found two more similarities. I already showed you a strange print near the Zeman crater. This looked like the print of a boot, or the foot of a machine. What I have not shown you, is a further enhancement of this print. To reveal the footprint of the dragon, I used software called, BAS Relief. We have found all important anatomical, and additional features of the dragon, except one, the bright shining pearl. As I mentioned before, the obfuscation technique they used, did not allow complete exposure of the machine, all at once. With each level of contrast, new details became visible while others disappeared. After I took two color images, and merged them, the bright pearl became visible, but not just the pearl. I admit that it does not 100% look like a pearl, but, it is located exactly under the chin, as in the dragon description, and you can clearly see that it is much brighter, than its surroundings, as it literally shines. Here is the process made visible. Two images merged together, with a software called to pick. This is the merged image. The pearl is shining very bright, and clearly visible underneath the dragon's head. Can you see it? Besides the pearl, something else, and also an interesting part of the machine, became visible. A second leg on the left side of the machine. One that is not standing on the moon's surface, but appears to be lifted, so was the dragon in motion while it was photographed by Clementine. This is what I consider as the back of the machine, and it looks like the leg, indeed does not touch the moon's surface. Two other very interesting parts of the dragon, are the, pole shan, or foot rule on top of the head and the extendable neck, with the scales running in two directions. The ones on the throat are reversed, and go from left to right. I wish I could have revealed more, but the machine appears to be partially transparent, and translucent, and that makes it for me very difficult, to bring out more details. Is there anyone, who could confirm the existence of alien technology on the moon? Yes people who have said to testify for the United States Congress, as part of the UFO Disclosure Project. Unfortunately, the Paradigm Research Group, was not interested in my research, and did not care about my findings, so I hope that someone, one day, will come forward, and confirm the Clementine cover-up, and the existence of these alien dragons. Project Golden Dragon, started back in 1998, and I had no idea of the incredible things I would discover. You have just seen a very small part of my research, and I hope that it has opened your eyes. We are not alone in the universe. Dragons visited us in the past, possibly looking for material to excavate. They left Earth, as perhaps they did not find what they were searching for, or the dragons did not want to further endanger life on this planet. Fact is that the presence of dragons was documented by the Chinese, and many other nations. To science, dragons never existed, as we never found. 
bonds or other pieces of evidence, and therefore we have never paid real attention to the possibility that dragons really exist. In my view we should reconsider our way of thinking regarding ancient aliens, as perhaps some of the weird creatures we see in statues, in drawings, and have read about in historical documents are not just inventions. Earth is no longer of interest to dragons, as else we would have seen them walking around. They appear to be non-hostile, so have we made contact? Was contact denied? Have they warned us not to interfere with their activities on the moon? It is time that we get full disclosure from our government, as I do not believe that they are not aware of the presence of dragons in our solar system.